We've simply been having a blast all quarter uh, working to create a, a crucible for this uh, very exciting time in which K-12, higher education, the boundaries, what's a university, uh, what are curricula, what are assessments, just a couple minor questions um, <laughs> are coming to the fore and will continue to get re-asked and revisited and we hope with uh, critical considerations, with data, with evidence, with innovation. And so our intent in this uh, course series over these three quarters, and I expect we'll do this on an annual basis because there's so much uh, uh, interest in it, I think it fills a tremendous void where uh, we can serve to be <coughs> a, a hub, a bully pulpit, a place for bringing together you know, theory, research, findings, innovators, educators. And so um, we're really glad to welcome you to this um, second uh, public forum of the quarter. Uh, each quarter we're going to do some number of these uh, and open them to the public, video, put it up on the web later, and hopefully engage a lot of you in some great discourse. Um, we have students in here. Raise your hand just so everybody can see how many students we have that are enrolled in this course. These guys are awesome. If you could only read their posts on the Piazza Forum around the questions that we have each week. And we had uh, a round last week where everyone said the things that they liked, that they wish for, and what we might do. And you guys are going to get it. Uh, one of the things that you wished for was that uh, your great thinking and writing could make its way out to the world. So we'll tell you more next week about this. Uh, but we're going to have some kind of a class book of you know, uh, edited and curated uh, responses from the things that you've been writing about on the forum. So really want to get that out to the public so that uh, you don't have all the fun. So tonight, we have a, a really amazing group. And I'm going to say uh, who all of them are and what brings them here and then set back, and then we'll call them up to the stage uh, one by one for roughly eight to 10 minutes to talk about the things that are, they're working on and that occupy them, maybe even things they're troubled by, things they're excited by. And then we will have, uh, have them here. I'll moderate a panel with a few questions just to kind of warm everybody up for the discussion thing. And then we'll throw it out to you and invite your questions. So that's our plan. And uh, we'll run till about 7.30. And so our first speaker tonight will be Kathy Casserly, right here in the front row. And she is the CEO of Creative Commons, about which you will learn much more shortly. We have Tom Vander Ark, who was formerly the Executive Director of Education for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. He is Managing Partner at Learn Capital, and he's written a book called Getting Smart, How Digital Learning is Changing the World. So he might have an opinion on this topic. Um, we have Steve Midgley, who's the consulting advisor to the US Department of Education and the former deputy director of education technology in the US uh, Department of Ed. We have Prasad Ram, also affectionately known as Prom, who is the CEO of Ednovo, which is a nonprofit that develops Guru, a search engine for learning. And uh, he comes with a very considerable background from uh, Google and machine learning and has some magic things to talk with you about. Mm -hmm. So that's my kickoff. And with that, unless you have other, any other procedural things, Mitchell, I'd like to invite Kathy. Great. Welcome. Thank you. And thanks, everyone, for joining us tonight. Thank you. Um, how many people here are grad students at Stanford? So I just uh, do want to share that my first um, office here as a grad student was on this floor in that corner. And that was my first two years. I actually wrote my whole dissertation here on campus in the basement at Coverly. Um, and so uh, there, is, and there was a time when I worked around the, walked around the Stanford campus and I didn't know if my, you know, my world would ever change. This was my ecosystem so much. So it was a, a wonderful journey while I was here as a student and it's wonderful to be back on the other side of the podium as well. Uh, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, Creative Commons and what we do. And I'll start a little bit with an assumption that some people don't know Creative Commons um, and that this will just be a very much a tip of the iceberg so you can learn more. Um, I did pass out some stickers for your computers and some buttons and there's some little pamphlets on our licenses so they're available somewhere where you can grab them on the way out. Um, 
So in many ways, as we think about the future of education and we think about the future of curriculum and digital content, we have to think about how we share that content. And what happens with the law, the law tends to be a little slow. And so we're still a little bit in the analog world when we think about the law and we think about copyright and we think about sharing. And the founders of Creative Commons realized the internet was here and it was an incredible vehicle for innovation and for sharing and for um, just things we couldn't even imagine at that time. So it was just about 10 years ago, actually, when Larry Lessig uh, and other co-founders, and Larry at that time was a Stanford Law faculty, uh, came up with this idea about sharing and about sharing on the Internet and what needed to make that happen. So if we look on the far left, we have the public domain. And if we look on the right, we have copyright, which is all rights reserved. And this is the domains that many of us know about. But when you think about sharing, you need a space in between. And so when you want to share, how do you share? And how do you let the world know that you want to retain your copyright? You work within the framework of the law, but you share in different ways. And in, in all of our licenses, which allow sharing and creativity, uh, you, you, it's attribution. So you, as the creator, you have attribution. You retain the copyright, but you let the world, you express to the world the freedom of how you want that content to travel. And we have a variety of licenses. Sometimes it's a share alike. Sometimes you don't want a non-commercial use. And sometimes you don't, don't want a derivative. And we can combine these to make our different licenses. And this is really important because this is the way that we've been able to really share and um, leverage the opportunities of the Internet. So when we talk about Creative Commons, I also want to be clear that it's a global initiative. It isn't just here in the U.S. The Internet is global. The world is global. And educational content and assets obviously travel around the world. We have 100 more and more affiliates in 70 jurisdictions around the world. They uh, sign a memorandum of understanding with Creative Commons. They're typically legal scholars and public domains. In the early days of our licenses, the licenses had to be ported to the local law of the land. And these uh, young scholars uh, would, t would take on kind of the um, onus of translating the CC license to the local, local region. Um, we also, and it is in 70 countries, we are now porting our license. Uh, we're versioning our license up to 4.0, and that will actually be an international global license, so porting will no longer be required. So the world has changed, and we obviously have to change with it. Right now, there are over half a billion CC licensed works that are out on the Internet. And when we think about the space, I'll be talking mostly about education, but uh, the world of the Internet is many different types of media, and Creative Commons license adheres to all different types of content. So it's around um, music. It's around artists who have used it. It was really the early bloggers who picked up. It was really the free culture movement who really understood the possibilities of sharing on the Internet. But it's also books, and it's photos, and it's governments who are picking up the license, and it's institutions. And part of the power of this and part of the power for education is that these assets don't just sit in one domain. We just don't think anymore about educational assets having this particular boundary. Actually, it's very many different types of content. We're learners throughout our lives, and as we learn throughout our lives, how does this apply, and how, do we, how are we able to remix and reuse these assets? The, the way I came into Creative Commons was through the field of open educational resources. So uh, after my Stanford PhD, I became a program officer for initially a small regional foundation here in the Bay Area, and then went on to the Hewlett Foundation just up the hill on Sand Hill Road. And we began to explore in 2001 how a foundation could make a difference in the educational terrain, and particularly in education technology. So I took my research skills, and we spent a year, and I worked with Mike Smith, um, who was then uh, the director of the program, and we began to explore how we could make a difference. And so we looked at the content on the web. This was 2001. We wanted to say, how can we make a difference? What are some of the examples we might be able to set and standards that we might be able to set? And in that period, as we did this exploration of education technology, um, as we began to think about what are the opportunities, the MIT actually open, open courseware project kind of walked through the door. And it was a big idea, it was a big bang in MIT about sharing their assets. And since then, this whole portfolio of activities has grown. Uh, funders from across the world have picked it up. People are sharing. Um, and it was many different types of content. But as you think about, these are some of the examples, uh, some of which you may know. But again, these are all different educational assets that can be sh reshared, repurposed. We don't always have to start from scratch. So that's one of the most important messages. We start from scratch again and again. And what we really want to do is focus on the pedagogy. 
we want to focus on the teaching. We want to focus on the learning. And we need to do it in a different way. So now we have a lot of content out on the web that's shareable that we can all use. Um, as a policy angle, when we think about this and we think about the value of kind of the public dollar, we should all have access to what the public pays for. And so uh, two years ago, under President Obama, and we'll see what the <laughs> results are tonight, um, he put forth in the Department of Labor and the Department of Education program $2 billion. And this is to go to community colleges to help retrain the workforce. And in the retraining, what they required in this $2 billion is that any, any assets that were designed and created as part of the grants carry a Creative Commons by license. So there's an incredible infusion of content that's being created under public dollars that the public will have access to. And what's really powerful about this, too, there's actually $500 million per year, and we're providing technical assistance to these uh, grantees of the Department of Labor and Department of Education. And what's important is that the community colleges just won't own it themselves. They'll get credit. They'll get attribution for what they create. But they will be able to share it among community colleges. And the content can go up to higher edu education classes. It can go down into the, K, the, higher, the high school space as well. And so again, we don't always have to start from scratch. As we think about this and we think about some of the, the values in these very tight, tight uh, fiscal times, particularly those of us who live here in California, we know how tight the education dollars are. Uh, here are two examples of recently, uh, within the past month, uh, pieces of legislation which now require, um, have a CC by license textbook. So California legislators put $5 million into higher education textbooks. They'll put out an RFP. Anyone can respond. They'll be looking for high quality. They'll be looking for scholarship. And they'll be looking for good value. But what they will do is instead of uh, the ownership being owned by someone else, actually the state will retain ownership. They will retain copyright. It will carry a Creative Commons by license. And then it can be built on and repurposed again and again. So again, we don't have to continually start from scratch. Sim similarly, British Columbia just announced about two weeks ago that they were also investing in open textbooks as well. This is a very kind of concrete example of how we can save money in the system, that we can continue to use the extra dollars for, to increase the, uh, the pedagogy. I just wanted to add this in as we think about openness. The po part of the power of the er early theory of openness, and particularly at the work at ULIC, as we built this uh, field of open educational resources, it had two goals. One was to level the playing field, to really make high quality content freely available, to, to democratize education. But the second was really to improve teaching and learning, that when you really had an open ecosystem, that you could put materials out there of different types of resources, and that you could actually collect data about how these resources worked for what students under what conditions and their particular learning path. And that you could use then this theory and this knowledge, and you could quickly iterate in an open environment to improve. And so that if you had this very rapid open system, that you could begin to really improve in a much more uh, rapid cycle. I just uh, do feel that I think on the MOOC world, no matter what conversation I have, no matter where I am, uh, I was in New York City uh, last week with a number of uh, meetings around data. But again, everything was around the MOOCs. And the MOOCs are all about data. And I know we'll get into this in the conversation. But this is really a large number of students who are journeying through these courses in different ways. Um, and that we have data that we're really going to be able to understand what works for what students. And how is this data then available for all of us, for the learning community, to really uh, to build on as we move ahead? And what can MOOCs contribute as we go, a go ahead as well? Um, let me end just at this point is how open is your work? Um, so my encouragement to the community here would to be very open. Um, you just mentioned these great blog posts that the students are putting out there. And obviously, there's issues of privacy. There's issues of security. I don't. Um, I completely believe in all of them. But there's also a lot of knowledge that gets generated. And it doesn't take anything away from your class. But can some of that knowledge also be shared with a broader community so that we can all learn from it as we move ahead? Open access is a very, very big player here in the scholarly space. There are over 125 million uh, articles, journal articles, that carry the open access. Um, and again, as you're young scholars, as you move ahead in your work, you might want to think of that as well. So I encourage faculty to share their content for all of us to be able to build and repurpose as we move ahead. With that, let me end.
So I, uh, I'm an engineer, uh, long story short, was able to serve as a public school superintendent um, and then help Bill and Melinda start the Gates Foundation in 1999. Uh, we helped to open about 1,200 new schools, and uh, almost all of those worked pretty well. We had the chance to work with about 800 uh, failing public high schools. They were harder to fix. Um, but I, I found after eight years and about um, $2 billion spent in school, uh, new school efforts and school improvement efforts, um, I had the chance to work with 400 nonprofits, and I, I left that experience frustrated by the limitations of uh, philanthropy and nonprofits. And that led me to, to launch uh, Learn Capital in 08, which is a, a learning venture fund here in the Valley. And uh, in the last couple of years, we've funded about 30 new uh, ed tech startups, most of them here in the Valley. And I, I also uh, I spend a lot of time advocating for the shift to digital learning and uh, uh, my advocacy group that my wife and daughter runs called Getting Smart. That's the name of my uh, book and my blog as well. I think the shift that we're going through right now is, is the most interesting and important shift in the history of learning. And, and it's important enough that it's one of the three or four most important trends in the world, certainly up there with biotech, clean tech, and the spread of democracy. You'd have to put it in in the top three or four in terms of the most important trends happening on our, on our planet today. And when I talk about the shift to digital learning, and I'm not just talking about the shift to print to digital, but really the shift to, to personalized learning with new tools in new kinds of schools. Uh, my book goes into some detail on, uh, around three big benefits. The first one's customization, uh, the potential for a customized path for every student. Second is the uh, motivation, the, the capturing the magic that casual game developers uh, ha have found that, has, that, that, that can make experiences um, calibrated to uh, the, an, an addictive level, uh, hard but not too hard. And then finally, maybe most importantly, the, the chance to lift the floor, not necessarily close the digital divide, but to dramatically narrow it and make sure in the next 36, 48 months in this country that every student and every family are connected to great teachers and great content. I just want to make sure that I heard you said 36 to 48 months. Uh, that so most states are going to implement um, online assessment in 2014-15. And I think what you'll see is a, a significant improvement in uh, the amount of access to, uh, to technology for, for all kids in K-12 uh, in the next three years. So well before the end of the decade, most kids in America are going to be in a, in a blended school, a school that combines the best of online and on-site learning in interesting ways. And here's, here's five really interesting trends um, that you'll see in those schools. And so you'll get about 40 seconds of, of each of these. But the, the first one is uh, profiles, Learn, comprehensive learner profiles. Uh, these are going to be, uh, Midgley knows more about this than, than anybody on the planet, but the potential to capture not just academic data, but what Steve calls paradata, the, the data around the academic data that will give us clues to, uh, to understanding the motivation of, of each student. This is a picture of Manga High, uh, a report out that uh, one of the game companies we invested in. And you simply see that uh, an effort versus achievement chart that gives teachers a clue at, at how many tries it took to get to a certain level. These comprehensive learner profiles will, will uh, increasingly tell us about uh, a student's motivation, and it'll help us pinpoint uh, the kinds of experiences that produce persistence and performance for every kid. If you want to know more, uh, look at digitallearningnow.com. That's a, a site that I started with Governor Jeb Bush and Governor Bob Weiss. Um, John Bailey, who I worked with at the Gates Foundation, and I are writing a white paper every month on the big issues uh, around uh, personal digital learning. And uh, a couple weeks ago, we published a paper called Data Backpack, and that goes into a lot of detail on learner profiles. Learner profiles are going to uh, power personal playlists. So my, my vision is that every kid will go home every day with a tablet uh, loaded with 
with their um, with a customized set of playlists uh, that uh, an algorithm and a teacher and that student uh, uh, have built a playlist just for them uh, at the right level um, and in the best possible learning modalities. And I think that has a chance to prepare them uh, to, to come to school and engage in much more uh, interesting and authentic uh, tasks. All of that is going to be powered by a, a new generation of learning platforms. Um, the, the interesting thing uh, about learning platforms is that there, there are four or five vectors. The old LMS people, uh, you have new Web 2.0 platforms like, like Edmodo. Um, you, you have states like uh, New York and uh, North Carolina with instructional improvement systems. You have the Gates Foundation's shared learning uh, infrastructure. You, you have uh, the online learning players, K-12 and Connections. Uh, and finally, you have ad adaptive uh, sequence builders, uh, adaptive content developers. And they're all really converging around this uh, kind of vision that combines uh, proprietary content and open content into a big library that can be uh, customized for every student. Now, I think these playlists can be combined with, as I said, really uh, interesting, authentic, community-connected, team-based projects. And so my, my vision for a blended school is really sort of expeditionary learning plus school of one. So a, a customized set of playlists for every kid and a set of team-based, authentic uh, experiences where kids are producing real high-quality product together. Uh, and finally, uh, progress. We'll, in this decade, we'll make the big shift from age cohorts uh, moving because they got a year older to individual progress models. Uh, Saul Khan's 3,100 videos were an important contribution, but his most important contribution is, is that he's teaching us how to do competency-based learning. This is an example of one of the knowledge maps that, that lays out for parents, teachers, and kids uh, what they need to know. And the combination of knowledge maps and then playlists that will cue a set of experiences uh, for a particular student as they move up this knowledge map and then badges, or uh, more broadly, achievement recognition systems uh, will help kids show what they know in multiple ways. And I think Saul Khan is doing really important work uh, in, in that regard, uh, showing us how learning is going to work in the future. Kids are going to experience this in blended schools, schools that combine the best of on-site and online in ways that are much more productive for them, and it will dramatically improve working conditions for teachers and also career opportunities, but maybe even more opportunity, maybe even more important is that we have the first, for the first time in history, the, the opportunity to extend a quality education, particularly a quality secondary education to every young person on the planet. I met this young lady in Kibera, the slums around Nairobi, uh, four years ago, and uh, she's now in one of our Bridge International schools. It's a super high-quality, uh, low-cost, affordable school. Tuition's about $50 a year. Um, and I want to build a great high school for her. And I think right around the corner, uh, maybe with Guru's help, is the potential on, on, on cheap plastic tablets with open content and blended formats to produce a very good high school for her that doesn't cost more than $150 a year. Think about that. That that opens up Africa and India, hundreds of millions of kids that don't have access to quality education today. And it's within our reach. It's months away from having the tools uh, to be able to build new schools uh, that can extend peace and prosperity like nothing else that we could work on. Thanks. Thanks. So uh, I will speak without slides, and we'll see how that goes. Um, I love going after people like uh, Kathy and Tom because they say things uh, better and they say things in a way that allows me to come in after with some, uh, with a little bit of detail about what I'm doing that fits into this uh, large picture of learning. Uh, so some of the things that we're talking about digital curricula, some of the things that I'm working on and thinking about uh, 
relate to how to make it real, in particular, in K-12 in the U.S. And so I want to talk a little bit about some of the things that you don't often think about as it relates to curricula that, um, that are really deep, deep requirements. If you're thinking about getting involved in a business, if you're thinking about getting involved in change from within inside a district or getting involved in state or federal policy uh, in relation to K-12, I think some of these issues are behind the scenes sort of the plumbing that you see in education that are required in order to realize some of the vision that we're talking about and Tom very uh, clearly uh, laid out uh, in, in, his, uh, in his talk. Uh, so one of the things that reasonably obvious, if you're going to switch to digital curricula, you're going to have to deal with infrastructure in various ways. So the, the infrastructure today for print is you back a truck up to a warehouse and dump off a pallet of books and figure out how to get each one of those books to every kid and teacher that needs it, right? So that's an infrastructure. That's a way. You need a road network. You need a purchasing system. You probably have some fax machines, right? So there's a number of things that you need in order to, right? But that, there's a number of things that you need in order to make that real. It's a market channel, and it works uh, insofar as uh, it's been around for 100 years or more. Um, but obviously, a number of us think that it, the time has come for, for a significant change to that model. Um, but if you're going to implement infrastructure, you know, there's some things that you might not think about. There's the content of the infrastructure, the digital creation, the content you know, that Creative Commons has enabled uh, so many producers to produce free content and make that available. There's also infrastructure in regards to the networks, right? If you don't have the backhaul to the Internet, to the school, then kids are waiting for their content at, at an insensible limitation. And there's a, that insensible limitation coming uh, from some work I did at the FCC, I know this insensible limitation is quite real and quite persistent in education in K-12. Um, there's issues around devices, right? Uh, if every kid has a textbook, then uh, every kid can read that textbook, right? It seems fairly intuitive. If every kid doesn't have a device, well, then digital deployment of curricula starts looking kind of peculiar. You go to the back of the class to get to the book, and then we'll come and go back to learning when you're done. You know, I, I don't, I'm not sure how that's going to work out. So clearly, access to devices, access to infrastructure for internet network, all those things matter. Uh, also, digital identity. I think you know, Tom talked about this personalization and a number of sort of stacking playlists and, and uh, learning progressions that are customized. Uh, without digital identity, uh, that's, that's going to be very difficult to accomplish because you can't, if you can't tell one individual from another, it becomes very difficult to uh, personalize. Uh, it seems obvious, but the fact of the matter is we don't have digital identity infrastructure that works in K-12 today. So if you, if you look around on the Internet, there is some digital infrastructure that's starting to knit together, log in with Facebook account, log in with Google account, right? You can manage your infrastructure. But, um, but digital identity in K-12 is, is fraught with legal issues, privacy issues, parental concerns about Big Brother, a number of things that we're going to have to address. So, so those are, that's a pastiche of sort of infrastructure issues. An, another area that I think is very important to focus on uh, is around the markets. This is another area. Um, I, Tom, I'm sure, deals with this frequently with uh, potential investment uh, opportunities uh, uh, in, his, in, his, uh, in his venture fund. Uh, I run into people who say, I'm in, I'm in 600 classrooms in 30 school districts. It's like, well, you now have 30 CIOs who hate you, <laughs> right? Wow. right? So how are you going to convert that into a revenue model right? if the market is broken? Right? So being able to sell into schools doesn't look like selling iPhones to retail consumers through storefronts like Verizon and AT&T. It just doesn't look like that. Now, we might want it to look like that, and we might be working on tools and solutions to get it to look like that. Tom mentioned platforms, which is, I think, a very important concept here. There is no real cable company for digital curriculum. So if you think about cable companies today, like them or, or hate them, they provide access, especially to sports, but also to other content. Um, no, that's true. Sports is their last bastion, right? That's the firewall to prevent you from cutting the cord on cable. Uh, they're very explicit. They know this. Um, uh, sporting events drive content, and, and they have their finger on the button. If you take your sports and put it online, we are going to push this button and drop the $2 billion contract that we have with you, and the numbers in that scale that they have for specific sporting events and specific leagues. 
in education, we have people with their finger on that button, but it's a paper button, right? <laughs> so when they're talking about digital curricula, it's just off the, it's off the map. It's not in the, in the zone of access. So the market Steve, is I'm oriented. Sorry, can you just say what a paper button is? I didn't, I didn't oh, oh that right. what I meant is paper print textbooks. Sorry, paper print textbooks. The button that the publishers have is around you must buy our paper print textbook. And they have a whole infrastructure. Not that they're evil, they're just making money. They, they, they have an infrastructure built around, it's true, I, 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 it's a totally rational marketplace. It just doesn't drive towards outcomes that we want, right? So it's not that anyone's doing the wrong thing. Everyone is making locally correct decisions. There's no sinister sort of villain in this narrative. It's just a bunch of people in an environment making locally correct decisions leading to really, really inappropriate outcomes for learning and learning opportunities for students. Is that? Um, all right, so uh, there's politics that feed into this. There's open v. closed questions that feed into this. But digital and open v. closed are two separate issues. We can have closed content and open content coexist in a digital environment. So that's, that's another feature that I want to mention. Um, all right. Uh, there's issues of capital formation and R&D. You know, there's a very, very anemic R&D investment in, in K-12, and that, that creates a lot of perverse incentives. All right, so I, I will run out of time if I spend all my time on markets. Um, culture, this is another area that people, I think, radically, radically underestimate how important culture in schools is towards making changes like digital curricula. Tom knows a lot about culture <laughs> from his small school's work at Gates, among other places. And so uh, if you don't understand the teacher communities that are operating in schools, I'll just give you a very simple example. You might create an, an environment, and I'm working on a project that's a tablet-based environment, K K-12, it's specifically focused in middle school. We want to go one-to-one, -one, right? We want to provide access. Every kid has their own device because it will create, these op create the platform for a set of opportunities around learning. If you just create the standard sales guy incentives, they're going to work their hardest to sell to every school in that district. So they're going to do the largest sort of carpet bombing solution that they can come up with that they can get the schools to agree to. That's in their local financial interest. So if you run your business that way, what you're going to get is a superintendent who says, all right, we're doing this. I'm totally fired up. We're going to do this. And they deploy into the whole school district, and the teachers say, oh, not this again, right? And they have a word for this. This too shall pass. They, they, this is a phrase that you will see all over the country. This too shall pass. And they will sabotage the effort, not because of the technology, which might be what they want, but because of the way it was given to them, which is what they don't want, right? And so unless you are looking at adoption cycles that that fit with the, the, the culture in those schools. So one example would be a pilot where you say, we create financial incentives for our employees and our sales guys to sell into the school district in a way that the schools that want it get it first and then more schools can draw in later, right? Then you start to see different kinds of adoption cycles in schools and school districts. All right, there's parental expectations. Parents, I learned from a paper textbook, why do you want to have my kid do something different, concerns about screen times, concerns about you know, wireless penetration in the brain. A number of things, some irrational, some rational, uh, some unknown, but parental expectations. P parents elect school boards. School boards set school policy. It's not the state. It's not the federal government. That's where the decisions get made. That's where the finances are. And so unless you're addressing parental expectations and parental concerns, you are going to bump up into, against a lot of status quo-ism. All right, and then the final point I'll make is around regulatory frameworks. Uh, and these are state and federal policy issues around data privacy, around adoption cycles, right, for paper textbooks. It is true in many states that you have to have a paper textbook. Williams Act in the California, they go in and count. <laughs> 28 kids, one, two, three, four. You'll see stacks of books in the back of the room. 28 books sitting in the back of the room, unused, you're good, right? The fact that you have access to digital curriculum as well, or we don't care. We just count the books and count the kids, and then we walk out with the check box. That's a regulatory framework, and that drives state schools to make certain decisions, which might not be in the interest of kids. It might not be in the interest of learning. But at one point, there was a a court that decided that Williams was a way of creating equity. And it isn't a bad decision, it's just out of date. And so there's a number of things that you'll see along those lines. But I'm really out of time, so, uh, so I'll just stop with the regulatory framework concepts and just say, as we think through these problems, I think we'll find that, uh, that there are a number of pieces to the solution. A number of different organizations are going to come together to provide them. Tom sort of painted a picture of that better than I can. I'll just name that uh, I think that the social learning components, I think that the student data interoperability, the content sharing 
the digital identity, uh, and the devices are all going to feed into the sort of four areas of infrastructure, markets, culture, and regulation that will create a digital environment or prevent one from being created in the time that we, uh, that we want to see it. So thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. Prom. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Uh, I was talking to a friend of mine, uh, Jack West. Uh, he's a teacher at uh, Sequoia High School. And his uh, class or his school uh, received a bunch of uh, Chromebooks from Google. These are kind of uh, smaller size laptops. And he was handing it out to each of his students. And uh, the students started typing using their thumbs on the Chromebook. And he had to tell them, no, you use all 10 fingers when you use a uh, netbook like uh, this device, right? So that's kind of the extent to which the community really counts on digital uh, services, digital products, and so forth. And today we have a very, very unique situation that all 7 billion people on this planet have a two-way information device. And these devices will get smarter, right? So for the first time in the history of humanity, we have everybody who has two-way information device, number one. Number two, the web has all the content you can imagine or you would want, and it, you know billions of items are being created every day. The web has all the experts that you want, you know the guys who go and write Wikipedia or uh, uh, you know contribute in other forums like Stack Overflow if you're a geek. And um, the web has all of your friends and community there. So in some sense, if I had a two-way information device and I had all the content community and uh, uh, experts accessible to me, now it's a matter of you know, figuring out how we are going to leverage this for learning. And uh, like it was mentioned before, the uh, governments and policymakers are also kind of uh, aligning. Now, you know, every president wants to be the education president, right? So, uh, so some, somewhere something is going right, and it's not just in the U.S., across the world. So when I imagine what digital curriculum is going to be, and if you said it's going to be an e-book, you know, we're going to take textbooks, digitize it, replace all pictures with videos. Sounds pretty boring, right? Is e-book the future of digital uh, curriculum? I kind of look at it as, or, or any one of these things, you know, yeah, we can take uh, some kind of, uh, you know, LMS system and, you know, track stuff and provide some course management and so forth. Since, you know, come on, that can't be what a digital curriculum is going to enable. It's really, there are two assumptions that we kind of have made with respect to education. One is you're going to study six hours a day in the school and two hours a day at home, right? So, so there are clearly time slots that we allocate for learning. Everything else is not learning. It's everything else, right? It could be playing, it could be eating, it could be whatever else. But if you kind of think about what is likely to happen, you know, kid is standing in uh, McDonald's line in... Uh, you know, has a smartphone with them. The smartphone has a GPS aware, and uh, something pops up saying, uh, you know, do you even know how the calories for a French fries is computed, right? Now, you're driving down from uh, San Francisco to Los Angeles on uh, Highway 1, and you pass uh, Hearst Castle, and kind of something prompts you, saying that, first of all, there's Hearst Castle here, and he was this uh, big baron, who did, uh, you know, however he made his money. A newspaper or oil, I don't recall now. <laughs> <laughs> One, somehow he made big enough money to set up, uh, buy all this art, right? So, so, the, um, so, so the idea is that learning is pervasive. You know, learning is not something that you do in some uh, slotted way, but you're learning at all points. You know, your parents pull, you up, pull up into a gas station, and, you know, if you even got the question, what does this 87, 9, 89, and 91 mean? Right? So why didn't they call it, uh, you know, uh, silver, gold, and platinum, as <laughs> we label it in everywhere else, or at least one, two, three, right? And so s somehow learning is pervasive. It's happening at all times, and your smart device is able to kind of prompt you with that, with these hooks, right? And then the second element of learning that we all have assumed is somehow there's a curriculum that decides what you're going to learn, when you're going to learn, how you're going to learn. 
right, which is kind of completely uh, inessential if you kind of had this level of a systems capability and all the digital uh, technologies. So I could kind of, uh, you know, pick up this uh, stuff on Hearst Castle, uh, uh, the factoid that pops up, and say, how did he make his money? You know, someone else more uh, realistic would say, you know, what kind of art is out there? Right. So, so, so each of us have our own learning paths. Each of us are going to discover things ourselves. So, um, so basically, if you kind of, you know, the way I think about how this whole uh, digital curriculum story is playing out is, if we had to kind of imagine what a movie is going to be, and we said it's a theater play with a video camera in front of it, right? Then you're not kind of fully exploiting what movie is capable of. A movie is not a video recording of a theater play, right? It has a whole set of dynamics that only the movie as a medium affords. And to me, if digital curriculum kind of affords pervasive learning and autonomous learning, I can learn at all times and I can learn the way I want to learn. But there is a curriculum which kind of ensures that I have achieved a level of proficiency that I need to achieve to kind of move from one uh, to be certified at uh, different levels. So uh, we have a lot of uh, activity, as uh, Tom and Steve and uh, Kathy mentioned, uh, in the industry overall, in the academics and so on. But I kind of see the biggest thing that we have uh, overlooked or not adequately looked into is that learning, there's a science to learning. And since I'm an engineer and we kind of... Uh, you know, position our organization as we are engineers for educators. But I can tell you, we don't know a thing about learning. You know, we, we can build systems. We can do big data analysis for you. We can kind of uh, do all kinds of crawling and indexing and search ranking for you, right? But we have no idea what learning is. And there's a whole science of learning, which is kind of, you know, uh, in um, people have mentioned that, you know, there's a psychology of how students learn. There's a social environment. And when you think about what the child goes through before they become a uh, you know, graduate of high school, you know, they go through childhood, puberty, you know, uh, divorces amongst their parents, you know, some kind of uh, bullying at school. So there's a whole society under which they live, and learning is happening in this environment. So people have studied this. People really understand what are the elements uh, that kind of make for good learning? And um, so what we are doing at uh, Guru is to kind of uh, build what we term as a search engine for learning. Basically, the idea is if you went to a, and searched for something, then you should be able to find the exacted curated list to learn, not, you know, a million good results where the first result is a Wikipedia. You know, if you're a sixth grader and you want to learn about uh, gravity and you get the Wikipedia page on gravity, you're not going to make too much progress there, right? So, so, but a sixth grade teacher actually knows how to create a playlist curating all the right web resources that you need to learn. You know, watch this video, take this quiz, here are the questions that you, some of your friends have posted on the question board, and you can answer those questions, right? So, so just, just a very, very short collection that the teacher puts together. Now, she understands the pedagogy, she understands... Uh, the sixth grade-ness of the student, and uh, they're able to kind of uh, uh, pull things together for you. So basically what we kind of uh, look at is uh, to provide this kind of uh, learning environment for th that enables digital curriculum, we need to address three things. One is a closed-loop solution. It not, does not stop with search, but you are able to study, you are able to create uh, collections, you are able to practice with assessments, you are able to interact with uh, the rest of your community. So then when the system has all the signals that it's generating through all these activities, then big data analytics uh, takes over and kind of is able to now run algorithms to personalize the learning uh, experience for individual students. And last but uh, not at all the least is an underlying resource architecture. And since we have seen there's a proliferation of Creative Commons content, open education resources otherwise, and all kinds of premium stuff, but there's no underlying resource architecture that ties it all together, that kind of has the right level of metadata. Since if I presented you with an eight-minute video on atoms and molecules from smithsonian.org, right, I'm not going to click it and watch it. Since it's like playing a movie in a theater, you know, I'm not going to just show up. I need to see a lot more information that 
you know, 182 sixth grade students studied this. When they studied this, they did well on the corresponding quiz. And uh, an average time spent on this was three and a half minutes, though it's an eight minute video. People kind of thumbs up, you know, so many people thumbs up it and so on. So if I can get some level of a quick uh, incentive or an endorsement, then I'm able to, I'm willing to engage in that resource. So, so we need an underlying resource architecture that, you know, basically captures all the folksonomies, taxonomies, ontologies, and organizes the whole information so that we are now able to kind of uh, leverage all of this for digital curriculum and digital learning. So uh, I'm extremely bullish, and we kind of uh, really think pervasive learning and autonomous learning is kind of the high bar that we all should meet. Clearly, there are baby steps that we all need to take uh, towards getting there. A lot of companies, a lot of... Uh, universities and uh, nonprofits uh, have been working at it and um, we are delighted to partner with uh, everybody who shares this passion and work with them thank you very much data big data we're all in favor of data five <laughs> orders of magnitude Pro more data, data. Um, how are we going to make sense of it all and to the extent that it even makes sense to call it we had a discussion beforehand Tom was saying, curricula, why do we need to call it curricula anymore? Um, learning resources, maybe it's a person, maybe it's a tutoring session, maybe it's a simulation, maybe it's a video, maybe it's a set of quizzes. Um, of course, curriculum designers out there, how many people have created some curricula in their life? So <laughs> lots of people. So one question I suspect they're all asking is, when does this magic happen that all these learning resources come together and all of a sudden you've got a curriculum sequence from which people learn? So there's a little too much so far. I'm going to play provocateur whenever I can here. Um, magic around how this becomes curricula. How does that happen? I, I think Prom made a point that there's baby steps down this road. So one of the important things for me is in, in all of these conversations about digital, talking about a staircase, so we can talk about the castle on the hill, which is fully automated, personalized learning. If, if you folks haven't read uh, Danny Hillis's short article, uh, if you just search Danny Hillis, Aristotle, the project Aristotle, uh, he just paints a vision. Some other folks have referenced Ender's Game, which is a, a uh, science fiction novel. But uh, these are pictures of this personalized sort of learning concept that can interact with you. It's very vague as to what it would be, but that's a castle on a hill. And I just don't think it's productive to be talking about replacing teachers with one of these devices. Um, I, it may happen someday, but it's you know year 2500 and there's Starfleet and you know all this other stuff. So <laughs> I, 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 it, it doesn't seem like it's something we need to worry about. We can, but we can be talking about if we were headed there. If that's a north star, literally a north star, Polaris, you know, several light years away. What are we doing to head north <laughs> if that's our goal? And that's what I think is important to be talking about in terms of big data. Um, the specific comments I would want to make, um, when I think about what big data is meaningfully in education, I, I want to say that as I, I spent some time, Tom alluded to Paradata and the learning registry and, and some of these questions, uh, my, my baseline hypothesis, sharing is the basis of education. So you can't walk into a classroom and say, today I'm not sharing, but, right, it just doesn't, you can't have that conversation. So somebody somewhere is going to be sharing something in order for learning to be occurring. And Kathy obviously knows a lot about sharing. Uh, Prom is enabling access and sharing. Um, so if we take that as an example, then we start talking about big data as a form of sharing. So we're collecting data, which is data is being shared somewhere from some place so that we can drive better learning. And then the question for me is getting the arrows pointed in the right direction. For a while, I was beating down the door of the flow of information the wrong way. I was trying to get organizations like Proms, and he's actually a good egg and was willing to go down this road, but commercial organizations and others, to share their pair data, their usage data, activity data, big data, outward into public so everyone could make use of these things. And what I realized is that arrow is pointing the wrong way. We want to drive more data into these organizations so they can do proprietary and interesting and value-creating things with them. The places where data are going to come from 
are the public institutions. And it turns out that the incentives, unlike almost any other industry, you cannot go to Amazon and say, would you share all your usage data with me so that I, you know, the, door, the conversation stops right then. <laughs> um, public education, school districts, schools, states, really have a lot of incentives to share. They have very few disincentives to sharing other than anonymity and privacy, those kind of questions. So driving big data from the institutions that collect and manage it into some public space that's accessible and then into organizations like proms who can make use of it, I think is a very powerful way of looking at the problem. Let, let me follow Steve's up. Just I, I'll give you four examples of digital learning environments that are now great sources of data. Right. So the, the first one is courseware, and that, that's been around for, uh, for 15 years, um, but it's becoming much, much more pervasive because we're seeing public schools uh, adopt uh, digital curriculum um, and, and uh, use it to replace textbooks. So uh, there are big providers like K-12 and Connections, um, Apex, uh, that now have, uh, have a, a ton of data mm -hmm. and a growing number of school districts that are using courseware and then supplementing it with a, a set of learning objects. So that's one. Two would be uh, collections, usually grade level collections. So Guru is an example, PowerMyLearning.com is an example. Um, three would be, um, let's call it uh, curated or, or crafted, often starting with a set of open resources. Kathy talked about starting with open and sort of uh, moving from there. So if you, if you go on Edmodo, uh, there's, there's probably 1.2 million teachers on Edmodo and a lot of them have a digital curriculum, and in many cases that started from, you know, a place like Guru, where they uh, they grabbed a set of resources, were able to modify those, mm -hmm. and drop it into a into a stream, and then the fourth is uh, adaptive sequences. So we're seeing an increasing number of of proprietary vendors building libraries of adaptive content, uh, Dreambox in in math, iReady in math and reading. Uh, Compass Learning plus NWA uh, uh, K-12. Those are three examples of, of adaptive content that is producing um, tons of data. Uh, so those are, are four sort of emerging examples of fully digital environments that are beginning to allow us to build uh, these learner profiles. Those yes, are all I, great examples. Can I just add one point yeah. to that? Is when we think about data, whose data is it? Right, it's the individual's data. We all own our data. And when we think to the future, how will whoever is the one-year-old who I just saw when I was walking in with his father by the voting stand here, he, will he own his data? How will he carry his learning data with him throughout his life? What will his data backpack look like? How will he choose how he wants to share his data? Because the data is ours. Each of us have our data. We each should be able to make a choice about how we share that data. And I think this is going to be a very, very important issue as we think about big data and as we think about the future. So um, Steve and Rich Collada and Karen Cater have made a big difference by advancing this idea of uh, my, my data, mm -hmm. my data button, right. which is basically an, an initiative to get school districts and vendors to allow parents and, and students to, to download all their data. But it basically makes the, the case that Kathy did, it's your data. You should take ownership of it and take ownership of your learning. So I want to begin to invite you into this conversation. Uh, we've had quite a span of topics even in these last couple minutes, right? Who owns the data? Uh, you mentioned, oh, anonymization. You know, just a, just a couple issues around data sharing. <laughs> Otherwise, it's We're such good. a good idea, right? Front of, front page of the New York Times today. You, you probably saw it. Kid on one side, all the companies with a, a telescope into yep. every one of their behaviors. Yep. 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 Um, so parent culture is going to contribute to this for sure. But let's uh, open things out. In, in the back, and Mitchell, how will we get microphones around? Uh, Abby and I will carry microphones around, and we have some, some equally intelligent people out here who might have questions and comments. Um, and we'll ask, uh, when we give you the microphone, that you stand. Um, and we would be pleased if you would introduce yourself, but we don't have any enforcement mechanism, so. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Jay Feudenberg, the founder and CEO of Finding QED. 
<clears throat> all of you touched on, a, I think, um, f at least for me, for entrepreneurs, a uh, critical uh, area, which is the culture of not-for-profit versus for-profit. And as you said, education is, a, is an industry of sharing, and it has a culture of openness and the culture of many of the participants, the teachers, is, uh, I, I guess one could say, is there's, a, there's a, a, a distaste for the word profit or for profit. And um, I'd like all of you to address it, but Tom specifically because of your yeah. uh, comments about how not-for-profit couldn't uh, solve some of the problems you were looking at. But it's as an entrepreneur who has uh, interesting things to bring to the table in the industry. I can't get capital to invest to build these things if there isn't a way to make money. And selling into K-12 is a virtual impossibility for small for small startups. So, so there's a there's a huge challenge. I, I hear out there everybody wants education to change. Everybody is waiting for the old model to be broken by the new model, the old model of the publishing industry and proprietary, and for the digital world to open up. But it requires capital formation, and it seems to me that Schumpeter, a famous economist who uh, you know preached about creative destruction, that seems to always be driven by, in our system, by the profit motive and capitalism. So uh, t two, two things quickly. You talked about a, a culture of openness, and I, and I would contest that. I mean, in our... In conversation beforehand, I, I was talking about innovation diffusion, the lack of innovation diffusion as a root problem in education, that a good idea won't walk across the street, mm -hmm. right? So <laughs> I, I, I don't think there is a culture of, of sharing. I think you have to be intentional about, about creating that. I do agree that there's a disdain uh, for uh, the profit motive, right? It, it is, and it's bizarre in how unique that is to education because in every other form of public delivery in transportation and, and health Medical. and energy and defense there are what are typically uh, productive partnerships there's bad examples but big projects are always in, uh, done as a public private partnership and i've and i've i've argued in in my book and in a lot of papers that the big advances in education are going to come from public-private partnerships that put the right form of capital to work. That government has to frame and name a problem and invite other people to work on, the, on that problem. Philanthropy has, has two unique advantages. One is it can take a long-term view, and two, it can and should promote equity. Those are the things that it's uniquely good at. And then three, private capital is really good at, at producing and scaling innovation. We should take advantage of those unique roles and, and invite uh, the private sector uh, to play a productive role in education. But it is, uh, I, I can't tell you how, uh, how strong the disdain is for the, the public sector. It's really um, unhealthy, but I think slowly starting to change. And I, I think uh, digital learning and, and uh, some openness to online learning is uh, is slowly changing that. But to, it'd be interesting to talk about your choice of uh, of tax status. Yeah. So so we are a five hundred one c three nonprofit, but we are uh, engineers for educators. Yeah. So the kind of the uh, even when you look at all the other ed tech startups, the the, the problem with education, or not the problem, the situation with education, which I kind of uh, briefly characterized as uh, it's a complex system dynamics. Since you cannot establish a cost-effect relationship. You can't say if you did this, you will get that, right? If I give you polio vaccine, then you won't get polio. I can establish that in healthcare, right? If you boarded the bus and paid me $5, I'll drop you off at the other place, right? But in education, I cannot guarantee you that. So when we kind of uh, thought about, so in, in a complex system environment where there are many, many parameters at play here, the way to kind of work on, around this is to kind of put up a free solution 
and continue to make incremental progress. Now, if you think about what the you know, for-profit world, which puts up free solutions, have done, and they're con continuously experimenting with it. So you know, there's this uh, thing called the Dropbox syndrome or the Dropbox dilemma or something, where basically it's a free solution. All of us have Dropboxes. And then we go to our enterprises and tell them, hey, we all have Dropboxes and we are sharing all corporate secrets on the Dropbox. <laughs> Can't you do, do a deal with these guys and uh, get a license for Dropbox? Right? Now imagine <laughs> right, if all teachers were to come to whatever uh, service you're providing and they're kind of already using all of your stuff and then they go to their principal and say, you know, you know, for a dollar per child per year, we can kind of get this uh, institutionalized. Now, I'm just pointing out to the fact that there is innovation that is being tried out here. I'm not saying there's a solution. Mm -hmm. But the fundamental problem with education, you know, to uh, kind of Tom's uh, point about why in this public delivery you don't have uh, a for-profit model that clearly works is it's a complex system. I can't tell you that if you studied something uh, that you know, you know, read this Wikipedia page, you will pass your exam tomorrow, right? <laughs> you will know a lot about photosynthesis, but you may not still pass your exam tomorrow, right? And uh, because of, you know, there are a lot of other uh, variables at play here. So uh, at least we, we have kind of taken this view that everything is free, everything is open, and uh, we kind of fundamentally believe education is a right. It's a human right. Which means, you know, if every you know, if uh, freedom of speech is a human right, you can't pay more and get a better freedom of speech, <laughs> right? It's quality invariant, right? And yeah. and and the, but well, we're, we're, today is an auspicious day for. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Let's put it that way. So 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 if education is a human right, then what you are actually selling is not uh, education or learning, but you are selling some business advantage or business terms or business convenience. And that's, I, I feel that's the space that we need to further innovate and figure out, so what is there to sell which, if it is not education? Right. So, Jay, let me just add that it, let, let's acknowledge that this bizarre antiquated, anachronistic system of local control is orthogonal. To well, well, can I, can I get you on that again? <laughs> <laughs> well, school, I, 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 school districts are at best inefficient and in urban America corrupt beyond repair. It, it's, it's not fixable. It's too bad and, you're on a school board, Mitchell. No. <laughs> and, and, my, and my point is that, that that entire system is largely orthogonal to the new anywhere, anytime learning opportunity that's being created. Right, so that that is a, a fundamental sort of root cause problem that we're going to have to come to terms with. Now, this is very slowly changing because over the last decade, states have taken control of the six big levers: standards, assessments, accountability, finance, data, and to some extent HR. Right, so that's being aggregated to the state level, and we're beginning to see more authorizing services happen at the state level. Uh, that will help, but but there is this layer. Um, that that we'll have to deal with, and that you, you, you've caught me a couple times on, on near-term predictions. This is going to take a couple generations to to fix. This is a very long-term uh, problem that that a couple year, a couple of hundred years ago we got this wrong compared to the rest of the world, and 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 it'll be a long-term fix uh, to to develop a new governance strategy that better educates America's kids. I want to speak to that just very briefly, or as briefly as I can, which is um, there's an aspect. So the the record companies were arguably fouled up in some some similar ways. Uh, they were not as deeply rooted into the politics and culture of society, and so right. they ch the change was much more rapid. Right. Uh, but we did uh, we did punish the sort of misbehavior. Uh, with some introduction of open and some other capabilities, technology, platforms, interchange. So I'm suggesting that these pressures can't, we can route around some of the damage prior to the comprehensive solution. And in fact, I think routing around the damage in some ways that we're talking about will help lend towards the comprehensive solution. And right. I do agree it is, it is corrupt beyond repair and it will take decades. Um, I want to speak to one particular issue about, around culture uh, with regard to sharing and what you will see with educators, and I think this is just a really important point as you're trying to understand the business and trying to relate to 
uh, how you connect into the schools. So sharing has two pieces. One is giving and one is taking, right? So one is using and one is creating. Whatever, however you want to frame that, there are two arrows that have to both occur. Sharing is not just me giving you something and you not using it. That is not sharing, <laughs> right? <laughs> that happens a lot in schools, but that is not sharing. That is not learning. Um, what you see in education as a cultural practice, as a norm, is we will share everything we know with anyone. We will use nothing from anyone else in our environment, right? That's the barrier. So when you're trying to understand the arrows of innovation, you don't have to work on them to say, will you give away what you have? Will you create or, 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 or share or produce? Now, they will say, wait, are you going to take it and commercialize it and make a buck? I'm not giving you that then. Yeah. So one of the ways to route around the damage on the sharing side, on the giving side, is say, we will make it open so everyone can have it at no charge. Now, commercial people might take it and use it, but other people. So let's, let's allow you to put it in the commons so that you can share what you know. So that is something that educators can relate to. That is a cultural norm that they will abide by. On the consumption side, this is a trickier bit. And so I, I, I don't want to digress us, so we'll move on. But, but the consumption is the tricky part. Um, Eitan Ayalon, co-founder of Global Tech Research. So first of all, I want to thank you very much for sharing these views with us because you all have a lot of experience in your fields. And it's, it's really a lot to digest, as much as I try to keep up on the field. I know that our focus tonight is more on K through 12. But I wanted to ask you, with the millions of people in the states and around the world, millions of adults that need retraining in order to be employed again, here in Silicon Valley, we have tons of engineers. And they have a great difficult time keeping up on the latest technologies. And it's easier to hire somebody right out of school than to, and I'm not an engineer myself, but this is a big, big, intractable problem. And I want to know how, you know, if you could comment on efforts right now that you see in online learning and in digital education that might be starting to focus on adults, that might be starting to focus on retraining, lifelong learning, because there's a whole generation or multiple generations that are going to lose out on this. We're going to have another type of digital divide, I think, where we have young people learning at a very accelerated and rapid pace and in a richer environment than older people ever had. And there's going to be an older generation or a middle-aged generation that in some ways gets left behind. So I'm, I'm curious to know what you think. Could I jump in on that? Yes. So, so just one quick thing. I mean, one of the slides I showed MIT OpenCourseWare, when that was released in 2002, the most hits were Silicon Valley engineers. This, you know, MIT is the engineering institution, scientific knowledge. People were all over it. And that, that was very clear, which wasn't necessarily an um, expected uh, effect, but it was um, clear that this thirst for lifelong learning is clearly out there. Um, the Department of Labor TAC grant, those, that is retraining, right? So again, these are retraining issues. So there's a lot of uh, concern about lifelong learning, and you're right, the next generation is going to be very different from our generation. We're going to have to learn continually, and how will, there'll always be a gap, and how does that gap move, and how do we keep it closed? So I think the openness is going to be really important, because it isn't just the K-12 system. We're moving into a whole new world about how we do this. Um, two other pieces, is just to think about it. So um, um, I'm on the board of a university called the Peer-to-Peer -peer University, and uh, this is really I, you know, was a, a new, innovative, fascinating model about how do we change the nature of higher education? How do we think about it? And, and I think there's two things. One, places like Stanford are really important. Students come here and they reside. 53% of students in this country go to community colleges. They do not live on campuses. So while we have the privilege to have been able to access schools like this, this isn't always the, the norm. And so I want to put that out for one. And when we think about things like peer-to-peer -peer university, a completely open system, open platform, you, having faculty scholars who teach courses openly, using open content, openly licensed, and so that there is a way for us to con continue throughout the globe to be lifelong learners. So there's new models that are emerging. Another one is the University of the People, who is really, really educating, again, people around the world. And I just got an incredible story about um, a Haitian student who would never be able to afford access, particularly at this point particular time after the, the crisis have, that have been there, but now again opening the platforms. So I think um, the whole model to the earlier conversation is changed. I think we've got a whole new system that's emerging. I think this system, uh, it worked for 400 years. It came out of the monasteries. It came out of the one-room schoolhouse. It's an agrarian system. Why do we have semesters, right? The world has changed and we haven't changed with it. And it's very, it's very stable because it's a uh, 
democratic structure because we have local school boards, etc. So it's going to be very hard to change it. That's the stability of it. So we're going to have to have a new system emerge, and a lot of uh, people who don't have access right now will be the first early consumers, and we'll have people who will innovate on the edge, and then we'll begin to blend, and there'll be a crossover, and the new system will emerge. But I don't think you're going to take the system that exists, and we're going to be able to. It just doesn't have the natural nimbleness or flexibility. Um, or the way it's structured to be able to shift. To it the does, however, have um, quite a few people in it who are very happy with with its existence and organization at present, yeah. and I mean, have perfect. a lot of capacity to keep things from happening. Hi, my name's Chan. I'm with Aspire Public Schools in Oakland. Um, I know a number of you have all touched on kind of the different stakeholders involved in education and how there are so many of them. I was wondering if you could speak to. Um, from the curriculum perspective, who really are you focusing on as your key stakeholders? Are they, are they, are, or like who are you focusing, who are you selling to perhaps? Um, is it really governance, so looking at school boards, or is it looking at administrators, your principals, um, or, or is it the students, like kind of for each of your organizations, where, where are you focusing? Uh, let, let, me, uh, let me quote John Danner on that, because I, I think he on uh, Monday had a really good blog that we reposted on gettingsmart.com. Uh, he said there's three ed tech pathways that you should pay attention to. Um, one is grind it out, which is like Dreambox, selling school to school with, with pretty good success. So it's a better alternative than the district slog, uh, the long sales cycles, uh, but selling sort of just under the radar screen, keeping your price point below 10,000 where, where principals can make a decision. So. In the nonprofit world, uh, ST Math is, is doing the same thing, but that's in the sort of grind it out model. Um, the second one is, is sort of ride the wave. So this is look, look for funding sources. Uh, wireless generation has made a lot of money um, on, on race to the top grants. Uh, Ed Elements has, has done, taken advantage of, of some grant funding, both private and federal. And then the third category is sort of B2C, but treating teachers uh, as consumers. And that, that's the big change in the last 24 months is parents, teachers, and kids finding, adopting web and, and mobile apps. So you see all three strategies being reasonably well uh, deployed in, in different ed tech models today. I would just add that from an infrastructure perspective, I think we will see next 36, 48 months, uh, interoperability of strategies from shared learning collaborative and some others uh, that eliminate some of the bad decisions that districts are making for structural reasons. For example, they must pick a winner. So we've got to run an RFP and then decide, is it Guru or is it Blackboard or is it, you know, what's, what's the model? And then we're going to deploy that, as I said, carpet bomb the whole school district with that, right? right? And, the, and with certain forms of interoperability, certain strategies, you can open up the door where we said, any one of these six products meets the basic requirements for security, privacy, data interoperability. So we'll, whichever one, schools, teachers, whatever level of individualization, I think you will start to see school districts begin to adopt a model right. where they say, we don't have to pick a winner. We just make sure that kids are kept safe, kids are protected, data is protected, and then the teachers and the schools can make the decisions they need to make for other reasons. There's, there's, only, a couple, um, there's, there's only a couple districts where you can actually get away with an enterprise approach. So if you, if you read, uh, Mark Edwards has a new book coming out this, uh, this month. Uh, Mark is at Mooresville, North Carolina, probably the most famous one-to-one -one district. And, and it's an enterprise approach, right? Everybody uses the same device and the same curriculum. And he's done so much work on culture right. that people feel really bought into the, the sort of one best system. But in most cases, particularly in an urban environment, uh, you need a portfolio strategy. And so... You take the historical portfolio strategy, which is close bad schools, um, fix struggling schools, open new schools, and you add digital. You add a digital overlay, so add digital options, add blended to your school improvement strategy, right? And and then to, to Steve's point, really take more of a portfolio strategy uh, to your technology as well, particularly because you're going to have to um, encourage kids to bring their own device to school. If you want a three-screen day. Small, small screen, production screen, sharing screen. You're going to have to open to, to BYOD. And BYOD is, is sort of another reason for being open. Um, uh, Bring your own device. device. So we all know. <laughs> <laughs> um, and just on that point, I mean, to make that happen, 
you need open standards, right? So everything can cross uh, platforms, you can cross devices, it's not locked down. So what Creative Commons has created is an infrastructure, right? We're an infrastructure play where anyone can build and innovate on top of, but that, and whether it's for profit or non profit, whoever has the idea, whether it's crowdsourcing, how it happens, but it creates this avenue for all this innovation to happen. And the, the device deployment, which is going to be the wave. And there's never going to be, you know, we're not, we've moved away from one size fits all. We have one here. Yeah. Uh, actually, can I just uh, make one quick comment? Yeah. You know, as an engineer, I can't uh, stop myself. So <laughs> I have built systems in my previous companies that has tried to integrate data from within the company mm -hmm. across four groups. Yeah? And it was, it, it's nightmarish. Since here you have one manager cracking the whip and telling all four of the engineering leads, saying, look, log your data. These are the semantics. These are the fields that you're going to log, et cetera, et cetera. And still we can't integrate the data. Now, you can imagine a school that kind of does this, uh, you know, pick your own uh, uh, learning solution kind of stuff. And, yeah, we can build, you know, good uh, standards and interoperability standards and so forth. But like people uh, joke about standards is the good thing is there are many of those. Mm -hmm. so, uh, <laughs> so, so as a result, you know, it, it's going to take a huge effort. That's point number one. Number two is uh, if you think about an enterprise, you know, it, they, these guys make money, and they enforce that everybody will carry a BlackBerry, right? You know, you can't walk around with whatever phone you want and whatever device you want. You know, everybody will buy this brand of an HP laptop or something of that kind, right? So, so because it's impos it's a very expensive process for them to kind of roll up, roll in this uh, BYOD kind of uh, model. So, so at least if we look into those we have some caution that it's not going to be easy. You know, I sincerely believe in the BYOD model. I sincerely believe in this uh, democratization so that teachers pick whichever tools that are convenient to them. But it's not going to be easy purely from uh, engineering and infrastructure rollout and management perspective. So l let, me, let me just clarify that in most cases, I'm, I'm suggesting that districts make a commitment to equity um, and, 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 and that usually means a, a, a standard device. And that BYOD should be something that you think about to go from sort of minimum to a high access environment. So uh, per particularly with the advent of online assessment, districts really ought to provision that uh, themselves. And, and it ought to be an equity layer that makes sure every kid has, has pretty good access. And that BYOD is sort of over and above mm -hmm. and not... Uh, typically device. not yeah. going to be your, your, your basic yeah. access layer. Okay. I'm Janice Jackson from the Stanford Center on Opportunity Policy and Education. I want to start with you. Uh, Tom, in the work that you did around small schools for the Gates um, uh, Fund, what did you learn about teacher change? Because all these things are wonderful. It's easier but, to start new than fix bad. Okay, <laughs> and, but that's not good enough. You know, as someone who's led change, as you know, in three large urban districts, the teachers are going to be there. And so what is it, what do you think it's going to take, and I open that to any of you, to really help teachers engage and, and begin to bring this into classroom in larger numbers, because right now they're terrified of Common Core standards and the new uh, state assessments. So they ain't thinking about this. Um, I'll underscore what what uh, Midgley said about culture. That one of the fascinating things about all the blended learning models that I've I've seen, I've I've been in, I've uh, been hooked by the technology or the structure, and then I went and visited them. And you find out it's really the culture that makes them really, really special. That's true. It's true if you go to Rocket Ship down the street here. It's true if you go to Carpe Diem. Uh, you know, it's it's true school in Mooresville. It's School of One. So culture and leadership matter a lot. Um, I, I, new school development is a lot easier than um, than than uh, trying to restructure chronic. Failure. Uh, the, uh, I mean, I, I spent a billion dollars working with 800 schools, and and it, if you know, you work with the worst of the worst secondary schools in the country, they're really, really, really hard to hard to fix. So, it, it is unfortunate to say, but the, the the best that we've learned is that in some cases you have to close a bad school and start some new schools. Now, 
the majority of schools can be significantly improved. Um, I, I'll just add that the, I think the one new ingredient that, that I'm still thinking about, that I think we're all getting used to, the reason that this is different than anything we've ever been through is that there's this subversive layer, this bottoms up, this parents, teachers, and kids finding and putting interesting tools to work, usually in a productive way. Um, I don't think we really even know how to deal with that. But, but what I tell superintendents, I'm writing a paper right now uh, with, with Scott Ellis on, on how to do blended learning. And, and it's not just an enterprise model where the wise men pick a model and roll it out, right? It is you, you now have to engage parents, teachers, and kids um, and empower them uh, not only to take control of their own learning but uh, their school. When there's a, a lot of productive stuff happening in a school, you have to find new ways to, um, to, to take advantage um, of that. So that means... Um, I think more sophisticated change strategies than we've had where wise men decide and, and roll things out in phases. So it, it is going to take, uh, I think, a lot more conversation uh, about how this happens. I have a quick question. Um, <clears throat> most of our discussion has centered around schools, and yet for so many innovators, informal learning and badges and games mm -hmm. uh, tend to be perceived as much more of an element of uh, innovative opportunity. Do you, can you speak to that? Is that something that you see is, is on your radar? I, I, I mean, I, th I think that that's right. If you, you know, I think Clay Christensen, you know, nails this in disrupting class pretty clearly. Uh, when you're innovating, it's better to compete against nothing. And the school district is most certainly not nothing. <laughs> so, you know, when you, when you try to get into a school district, you're dealing, whether you're going grassroots and subversion, you still got, as I said, the CIO who's now your enemy, right? And he's trying to stamp this out and turn this off. And, you know, so there's a bunch of crazy functions inside the school district that lead to all kinds yeah. of unanticipated consequences. So if you're an, an early stage innovator, you want to go to where the free capital is and where the free uh, choice is, which is, you know, parents and, and students. Um, that, that said, I want to speak briefly about teacher engagement in this, uh, this original question. Um, I mean, I'd lay three things on the table that, that if I were talking about working with, uh, with a set of uh, teachers in a school, one is choice. Teachers want choice. They desperately want choice, and they will respond in various ways, sometimes positive, sometimes negative, but they will respond in behavior changes with choice. Mm -hmm. They want respect. And choice without respect is they see that coming a mile away. And then they need accountability. And accountability without choice and respect is, is offensive to me. And it's something that I see again and again in public education today. But when you combine those three things, I think you can then start having a productive conversation with teachers. There are the worst of the worst schools. And those schools need to be shut down. And we need to start over. But that's, I don't know if that's 5%. That might yeah. be 0.5%. There's a very small number of these schools, no, and they are horrific. <laughs> but the schools in the middle uh, can be addressed in that let, way. Let, let me just, uh, two quick ads uh, about why I think this is really cool for teachers. The, the first is personalized learning is not just for kids. It's for teachers, right? So the, the, you take uh, Bloomboard and Jason, who came out of this school, Jason Lang, um, is now helping a handful of states in 100 districts personalized learning for teachers. So teachers, everybody's got an individual learning plan and lots of very cool individualized resources for teachers. Second thing, blended schools are a hell of a lot better places to work. So it's a blended learning is a team sport, so new teachers can walk into a team in a much uh, better supported environment where they have a lot more data about the kids that they work with. They have a, a much more attractive career progression, leadership, opportunities both inside and outside the school, right? The proliferation of, of options for learning professionals outside traditional schools is, is growing like crazy. So I, I think we can create options for teachers that, uh, that are, are, are really much more attractive than they have been historically. Um, yes, my name is Kareem Edward. I'm an educator from Los Angeles. I wanted to speak to the conversation about share. So um, what are some of the mechanisms that are being put into place 
where the actual content that's being created, curated, and put into these platforms is coming from various locations, where it's not only from Stanford, MIT, Harvard, where if you may have folks um, in Africa, India, that also have valuable information to share, that they're able to have their content, their curriculum hit kind of like that equal playing field. Because already when you kind of look at these kind of bleeding edge platforms, it's always this conversation of, well, let's use the poor African kids, the Haitians, to give them and disseminate information so they can learn better. But what are we doing as far as making everyone's content be able to have some type of value so we all can learn on an equal sharing playing field? Yeah, I just want to say that's a great question. Um, and uh, from the very beginning in open educational resources, the idea was that it certainly wasn't one directional, that content flows across the ecosystem, it flows into the commons, and that's the power of it. Um, there are many examples. OER Africa is one of the institutions we started to make sure that actually this, this would happen. Uh, there's an incredible uh, initiative between Michigan and Ghana where <laughs> Uh, Michigan, actually University of Michigan um, uh, uh, medical school um, teaches a lot of the African teachers, but the knowledge is actually in Africa about how to care for some of these diseases. And so the knowledge flow and the, the ability to share is critically important. Um, I think when we think, uh, um, just Creative Commons has um, regional coordinators throughout the globe in the Middle East and Africa, Latin America, Asia, Europe. And the idea is to make sure that each group is incredibly empowered, particularly the uh, Latin America has been very active in the open educational resources space. Uh, Eastern Europe is incredibly important around Poland. Same is happening in Africa just because it's um, a place. I think the, um, so two things. One is it's critically important that the um, flow is bi-directional. That's why the open standards are really important because the devices that are available, right, are really um, a problematic. They're not the same everywhere, and so the content has to flow. I, you know, I don't necessarily agree with Tom's vision of, um, you know, have all the content on a. What, you described a one laptop per child, right? We start. We tried that six or seven years ago. That was sort of a content-free approach. Well, I was like, trying to figure out what content. But, yeah, but, but, yeah, other, sure. but the but the only issue on that is, is just to say to challenge to say the system has to move ahead, <laughs> and that it's not going to just be a content device. Pedagogy is really important. How do we change the structure of teaching? What does the next phase of teaching look like? How do you move from the sage on the stage to the guide on the side? That takes a different skill set. How is the Stanford School of Education preparing those teachers for tomorrow? Because that's where we need to move in places like Stanford, which are critically important to the faculty, to the research that goes on here. You are where people turn to for those examples. And so I think that is really important as we have this conversation. Um, and there just are, there are a number of platforms. The peer to peer university is one, University of the People is another, but truly really trying to get this cross cultural flow is vitally important. It cannot be a colonialization and a new form of, of content flow. So I, I think that was a great question, too, and Kareem. And I think we might need a metaphor that goes beyond sharing. Sharing has certain key elements, but already you were saying, mm. yeah. well, it means two way. Yep. Uh, yep. We often use the term knowledge building communities as one mm -hmm. way to think about it because there, then there's a reciprocity to it. Uh, Doug Engelbart's concept of networked improvement communities. Mm -hmm. uh, waking up up on the hill at Carnegie, uh, I think this is another concept that we can employ. And certainly we've got networks. Yeah. <laughs> whatever else we have in the notion of improvement, at least gets you into debating, well, what is it that we're improving? So you can have those discussions about norms and values and a, a sense of we in the collective, which sharing alone doesn't do. And it doesn't bring in uh, everybody in a level playing field from just, other nations. Just kind of uh, add to that, right? There are models of sharing that has worked on the web today. Like Wikipedia is one great example. But beyond Wikipedia, if you look at Quora or YouTube, or you know even Stack Overflow and so forth. There's, you know good models of sharing where it's not like MIT is going to disperse or uh, Coursera is going to disperse certain courses, but it's like everybody in the world gets to kind of contribute and it you know contribute or uh, participate in uh, both directions, consume as well as publish kind of stuff. Yeah. And the interesting thing about these models is they have also relied on social signals. A number of views, number of thumbs up, number of thumbs down, and you know things of that nature. So that way, you know, good things bubble up. Good things, as voted by the community, bubbles up, as opposed to as uh, deemed by the prestige of the institution, or so forth. Right. So, so I think 
you, you know, education needs to kind of uh, look deeper into some of these and adopt these models that have generally worked and kind of uh, will that way get, democratize the whole content uh, creation and knowledge creation process, not just consumption. Well, I think with these very optimistic closing remarks, I would like to first welcome any of you to come any Tuesday night from 5 to 7. You'll find us here. Uh, open arms for the community. Please feel free to join us. The syllabus uh, is online. Is website, the readings are online. edf.stanford.edu. Um, and uh, let me uh, please begin with a great round of applause for a fabulous panel.